Thank you all for, for, for coming. Um, my talk, my talk or mini talk today is titled Space Time Beyond Einstein. Um, unlike many of the child wives, for those of you who are regulars, this is going to be about something not very tangible but rather abstract. Um, I'm going to try in this little talk to introduce you to what uh, uh, I and several other theoretical physicists con consider to be perhaps the most uh, pressing, outstanding, unsolved problem of theoretical physics, maybe the problem of constructing a, a quantum theory of gravity, okay, or a quantum theory of space time. So the talk is going to be abstract uh, and will last for about 20 or 25 minutes, uh, after which, as you know, there will be a question answer session. During these 20 or 25 minutes, if you have brief clarificatory questions about, I didn't understand what you just said, uh, please ask. Uh, broader questions, we can take it. Okay. Uh, okay, so my talk will be divided into three, three sort of parts. The first part it introduces the notion of dynamical space time. Uh, this is basically introducing what Einstein taught us about, uh, uh, about 100 years ago. Uh, and then I'll tell you about quantum fluctuations, something else that we learned from, uh, from, from the study of quantum mechanics about 100 years ago. And then I'll tell you about the problem of trying to put these two notions together. The idea of having a dynamical and fluctuating space-time together, uh, why that's difficult, and what attempts have been made. Very briefly I'll tell you about some of the attempts that have been made to try to address this question. <coughs> okay, so about dynamical space-time. So firstly, what is space and what is time? Well, we all have an intuitive idea of what space is. Space is where we are located, that which we are located in. Okay? So that in which everything is located. Any event that happens, this, this ball of fell on the table, that's an event, it happens in space. Okay? And uh, those are not going to be important for my talk. You can parameterize where that event happens in space by three numbers, namely how far to this side, how far to that side, and how far out. Give you three numbers, you completely locate an event in space. Now, in relation to space, things happen in time. They happen at a place, and they also happen at a certain look, location in time. So, at a certain time, 11 o'clock. Okay? So, time is also something in which things are, at events are located. And the location in time, unlike the location in space, is parametrized by one number. They pick what time? 11.30, not three numbers. So, to completely parameterize where and when something occurred, you need to specify four numbers. Three numbers for where it occurred, one number for when it occurred. Okay. Now, until 1915, when Einstein came up with his general theory of relativity, space and time were believed to have been a passive, a passive unchanging grid or stage upon which the drama of the universe is played out. There's space, in fact, there's this lovely quote by Newton, which I can't remember offhand, but something like space forever unchanging, blah, blah, blah. Something that's just there on which everything happens. And uh, a, similar, a similar quote about time. You know, it's interesting that someone as early as Newton, because he was such a deep intellectual, worried about what space and time were without just taking it for granted. But he made the obvious assumption that they were just passive backgrounds on which things were located. Okay? And this is what everyone assumed until 19. Then, in 1915, Einstein had a deep insight about the nature of reality. Okay? His deep insight was that the geometry of space and time is not something that is there, fixed and given for all time, sitting and upon which you know, things happen, in which things happen, while this background is unchanged. Einstein realized that the geometry of space and time is itself dynamic. Namely, it changes in time, and it changes in time in response to what else is happening in the universe. Okay? So, if the Earth goes around the Sun, that changes the geometry of space and time in the neighborhood of the Earth a little bit. Uh, when this bottle is thrown out into the air, that changes the geometry of space and time in the neighborhood of this bottle a little bit. Actually, very little bit. But, uh, so, okay, so the geometry of space and time are dynamic. And the important thing is that space-time is not a passive stage on which things happen. Space-time is an active participant in dynamics. Okay? So, as things happen, the geometry of space-time reacts to what's happening. 
and influences what's happening. It's one of the dynamical variables periods. This is the key insight that Einstein had, and it's a completely correct insight. It's been experimentally verified in 20,000 different situations. It forms the, the, so the important conceptual and uh, equational basis for our theories of cosmology. Okay, uh, I know that this is abstract and not everything I've said has made sense, but if there's some simple clarificatory question, I can take it now, otherwise we can talk about more deeper questions. Yes? What do you mean when you say geometry? Excellent question. Uh, well, I mean the geometry of space-time is, is something like this. See, I'm going to give you a two-dimensional analog. Um, the real world, as we've seen, is four-dimensional. There are four numbers you need to specify, three space, one time, not just that's five right but let's suppose there was no time, and suppose there were only two numbers so we could visualize it. Okay? So one kind of geometry is a plane. Suppose we were in a two-dimensional world, we were ants that were stuck to a two-dimensional world. You can imagine being on a plane that was flat. And if we were intelligent ants, we might draw straight lines and draw triangles and figure out, like Euclid taught us, that some of the angles at the vertices of triangles will always add up to 180 degrees. Well, there's another kind of geometry that you could, you could imagine in two dimensions. Something like a globe. <coughs> you could be on the surface of a sphere. Okay? Little ants walking around, if they walked around just a very little bit, wouldn't easily be able to tell that they were on the surface of a sphere or a plane. But if they made large triangles, they would find that the sum of angles on the triangles don't add up to one So, a sphere is very different from a plane. If you keep walking in as straight a line as you can, you come back to yourself as a sphere. You never come back to yourself. Okay? So, now suppose we were on a sheet of rubber that was vibrating in response to what was happening. The sheet rubber could initially start off like a plane, but then curve around. Okay? That, that would be the analog, the geometry of space responding in a dynamical fashion. Now, exactly that is happening, but this geometry is not two dimensional. It's not even three dimensional, it's four dimensional. All coordinates of space as well as time are changing around geometrically in a manner analogous to this rubber sheet. To say more, I would have to say it mathematically. But does this make rough sense? Thank you. Okay. Now, this idea, the idea I try to, I try to explain now, is pictorially represented in a picture like this. This is the plane we talked about. And this is, say, the Earth or the Moon or some heavy object. And it being there, warp space. Warps the rubber sheet of space, of course, in four dimensions, space and time. But this is a rough an analogy. Okay? And an analogy called space time, when curvature is weak. Um, the effect of this curvature of space time, this is not obvious, but you have to believe me, can be approximately uh, encoded by saying, by ignoring the fact that geometry is changing, by seeing flat geometry, but associating a force with masses. And it turns out that in this weak approximation, if you recover the classic Newton law that we all learned about in school, objects attract each other with an inverse square law. However, this is only correct for weak curvatures. When curvatures become strong, when the thing bends like that, there's no sense in which you can approximate the notion of this curved space time as a force and flat space time. You really have to deal with curved space times. And this changes our view of the universe, it changes the mathematical equations by which we model the universe. Okay? And Einstein's theory is very successful in describing cosmology, the theory of the theory of how the universe evolved from a very early age to where we are now. Uh, it's not just successful, it's necessary. Newton's theory would not have been successful in describing uh, cosmology. Okay. So I've finished telling you all I'm going to say about dynamical space-time. Any quick clarificatory questions or comments before we move on to the next part? Say, curvature can you explain curvature? Curvature! Okay. Uh, just think of it intuitively as being not flat. You understand what it means for something to be flat? Right? Think of it intuitively as being not flat, something like this. Uh, one way of characterizing it is to try to draw triangles and check if the angles, some of the angles at the edges will add up to 180 degrees. There are more interesting and precise characterizations of curvature, but I won't get into that at this point. Yes, please. Uh, as of now, when you're showing a picture, the curvature is only bending in. Yes. So what, happen, what happens to space-time when your curvature does 
not bending, the curvature bends outwards. Yes, both these can happen. It's a very good question. Both these can happen. Curvatures can be both positive as well as negative. Um, you know, if you look at this, the sheet of uh, a saddle, where you've got the saddle going like this in one direction and this in another direction, that is a sheet with what, what is called negative curvature. 